There is hope that a Pierre Polyev government will certainly do things better. We will give new meaning to the whole concept of transparency, accountability, and trust. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. We are very excited to bring you tonight's episode because we are sitting down with four members of the Conservative Shadow Cabinet to talk about some of the major concerns that Canadians are facing right now. We may not have had a chance to ask them every question that every one of our viewers wanted, but we hope that we represented you all well. Without further ado, here are the four Conservative members of Parliament that we are speaking with today. Stephanie Cousy, Member of Parliament for Calgary Mid Nippur. Larry Brock, Member of Parliament for Brantford Brant. Garnet Jenis, Member of Parliament for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. And Kelly Block, Member of Parliament for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of a busy Monday to talk with us on Northern Perspective. We really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation and talk about some of the very important topics that are concerning Canadians from coast to coast, as well as get into some questions on the Arrive Scam scandal. Thanks for this opportunity. I know our team here is really jazzed uh, to do this time with you. We are big fans of uh, Northern Perspective. And we're so grateful for all the love that your base gives us. We're just, we know we're all on the same team. We're all, we know we're all working towards a Pierre Pauli of government and getting this Justin Trudeau guy uh, out of the top job here. And again, we're just so grateful for what you do and for, for your listenership and for your leadership and growing that leader, uh, listenership and, and leading them towards a better Canada. Thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you for all of the hard work that all of you do that we do see on camera and that we don't see off camera. So before we get into the serious questions, we want to know what drives each of you as a member of parliament. So this question is for everybody. Uh, many Canadians dedicate themselves to public service through various paths, including running for parliament. What motivates you to serve Canadians in this specific role? And maybe we'll start with Mrs. Block. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, I thought about this question and it's one that I'm asked often by constituents and students actually when you go to speak to them in their classrooms. I would have to say that for me, I'm very familiar with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but one thing that I've often uh, reflected on and thought that probably needed to be talked about just as much was our responsibility as Canadians, the responsibility that we have to um, our communities and uh, to our provinces and to our countries. So that would be the first. The second would be the need for courageous leadership. I think that is something that um, uh, drew me to, to running, uh, recognizing that um, not only should men and women who seek this office be men and women of integrity, but they have to have courage. And finally, I'm a mom and a grandmother, and so it's those future generations that I'm concerned for. Excellent. Mr. Jenis. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to be on with you today. Uh, my journey to working on procurement issues and, and arrive scams specifically has been a bit circuitous. If you had asked me a few years ago if you thought this was an area I'd be involved in, I, I would have expected not. Uh, I, I've done a lot of work over the eight or nine years I've been in Parliament on international human rights issues, security, foreign policy issues. Uh, and that comes out of my own sort of familial experience. My grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, my wife's parents were both uh, born as a, as a religious minority, uh, members of a religious minority community in Pakistan. So uh, international human rights issues uh, are, are a big motivator uh, for me. Uh, but, um, but kind of early on in the tenure of, of, uh, of our leader, Pierre Polyev, uh, I was put on the Public Accounts Committee and the Government Operations Committee. Uh, which was new to me, but I found it really, really interesting and just such a pleasure to work with these, these folks here. So one, of the, one of the great things about being a member of Parliament is that you can be fairly versatile. There, sometimes you come in thinking, I'd really like to work on one set of issues, and then uh, because of events that are going on, you get, uh, get uh, drawn into another area as well. 
Excellent. And uh, I have to say that one of the, I think, most popular <laughs> um, questions that we get on Northern Perspective is um, to replay a clip of yourself. And it was um, at you questioning David Yao, and it, it was straight out of the movie Office Space. And I think you know exactly what I'm talking about when, when you uh, said to him, what is it that you do? <laughs> so... <laughs> I actually got a letter from a constituent who wants a T-shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to work on that garment. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have, we have a very sort of complimentary team. And one of the things that I felt when I first came on is, um, you know, the, um, uh, especially Stephanie and Kelly, our shadow ministers, have so much expertise on this. And I was like, I don't, <laughs> this, I, I know so much less about this. But then I was also trying to just think as a lay person who didn't know as much about the subject, Kind of what kind of questions they would ask so so uh, i came in as the as the person who knew less about the subject but trying to say things that that, that were simple that i wanted to know uh and uh so we've been we've been a great team that way being able to kind of play off each other's differences of experience and expertise for sure and that comes across really well uh even on camera as well uh mrs Cousy. I'm so lucky. So I was born and raised in my riding of Calgary, Minnesota, and I think that had an incredible influence on me. I come from a small business family, and as well, a community that was really built on the back of the natural resources sector, oil and gas. Uh, but I remember like just the tenseness around the dinner table, depending upon how the store did that day, good or bad. And I remember one time my parents were talking about uh, taxation. And my dad was explaining like all the taxes we had to pay. And I said, dad, you know, how can this be? Why, why do you pay so much money? Why do we pay so much tax? And he said, Stephanie, he said, we live in a good country. Don't you ever forget that. But I really think that we've seen this erode uh, in, in recent years with Justin Trudeau and similar to Garnet, I have a bit of a, I have a background. Uh, I was actually a diplomat before I came into parliament for 15 years. I was in the Canadian Foreign Service. And I had um, postings in fascinating places like El Salvador and, and Dallas, Texas. But I think coming from such an incredible nation and having the opportunity to go to other places and seeing uh, places where there are a lack of democracy, a lack of freedom, um, really inspired me to sort of want to take uh, the, the good things in Canada that I have been raised with, the, the freedom, the democracy, um, the, um, these ideas that Pierre, our leader, really aspires to, and really try to work for them within the Parliament of, of Canada. And I think a defining moment for me was uh, when I was in El Salvador uh, negotiating the, the free trade agreement there at the time, and so I prepared my talking points, you know, okay, we're ready to move this on pork, this not on sugar. And so I was meeting with the Minister of Trade. And so I was all prepared, and the Minister of Trade snapped the document out of my hand that I had printed off of the secure fax and said, you tell your government, I'll get back to them in two weeks. And it really became evident to me in that moment that I was just the intermediary and not the one holding the pen. And I decided in that moment I really wanted to hold the pen so I think it's just a, a love of the Canada that I was raised in and all the good that it did for me, for my family, seeing the contrast of what there is abroad and seeing us slowly stepping towards these places where I lived and visited, which just don't share the quality of life that we've known as Canadians, which don't share the freedoms that we've known as Canadians, and wanting to do something about that um, not only for the the citizens of my riding, because I would like them to have the same incredible quality of life that I grew up with, but also for the citizens of the world that this is possible. And I do believe this is possible under a pure quality of government. So those are my motivations, and it is a total joy and honor, Cypher Fox, to do it with my colleagues here today. Excellent. And um it's it's always something when you know you have strong MPs like the four of you that stand up in the House of Commons and try to hold this government accountable and um, because Canadians really do feel like you are standing up and are their voice and that's what we uh, that's what we get as feedback um, on uh, on our live streams on our on our comments uh, we we encourage Canadians to you know let their MPs know when they're doing a good job, because often you only hear the bad stuff. Um, but uh, it's just as important to uh, to get some fuel, um, especially when 
um, uh, Damien Curick, he stood up and, and had the courage to call Justin Trudeau a liar repeatedly, despite the fact that he knew the consequences of, of, of his actions there. And it's important to stand up and tell the truth because uh, that, that is real courage in a democracy, uh, we think. Um, um, so you on to your... favorite singer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Damien Kirk. <laughs> and over to you, Mr. Brock. Yes, th thank you, Cypher and Fox. Um, fantastic question. A great question that I often get asked when I attend uh, meetings in my own riding or speak at functions, holding town halls, even outside of my riding. So I think most of your listenership would, uh, would probably understand a bit about my background. I've been in public service now. I'm entering my 21st year uh, as a member of parliament, only about two and a half. Prior to that, as a crown attorney. So I have long held a passion for serving in some capacity as a crown, serving the courts, being a... Um, a minister of justice, so to speak, in the loosest uh, terms, but also to ensure that I was a voice for the victims, that I was ensuring that anyone that appeared in my court would receive not only a fair trial, but that I would ferociously prosecute the individual, regardless of color of skin, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation, I was completely colorblind to all of that. An accused comes before the court, deserves a fair trial, but you also need a Crown Attorney that is also going to advocate to the best of his or her ability. And I never was the type of Crown that simply mailed things in. I ensured that justice was served. Not every case I prosecuted had a happy ending, but even those cases, very difficult cases involving sexual abuse of an adult or a minor where the outcome was not as planned. At least the victim knew that I was a fighter and I left no stone unturned and I ensured that their voice was heard. That meant more to them than actually seeing a person go to jail. A person serves a period of time, they get out, they move on with their life. The impact for victims quite often is a lifetime impact. So knowing that I bonded with my victims, I provided them with a voice, I trusted them, they trusted me, meant a lot. But over time, particularly in the advent of the Justin Trudeau government in 2015, I saw my small community of Brantford and Branch just being ravaged, out of control, serious crime, homicides through the roof, stabbings, uh, gun crime, drug crime, all kinds of personal violence. It was completely out of control. I knew that there was some problems with our criminal justice system, particularly bail with light sentences. The police were doing the best of their ability with the resources they had, but they were maxed out. And I finally said to myself, Larry, you know, you can gripe and you can and uh, complain all you want, but it's gonna fall on deaf ears as a servant of the Ontario government. If you really want to affect change, you legislate change. So that was a, a major driving factor for me when given the opportunity of a vacancy opening up in my riding at a very late stage of my life to consider starting all over again in politics. Not too late there. Not too late, thank you, Seth, for that. <laughs> <laughs> my wife would say it was too late, but. Nevertheless, I feel I feel completely re rejuvenated, revitalized in this role because now it's not just victims I'm advocating for, it's all of Can Canadians who feel that this government has so let them down. Another important piece for me is in my small way, I would love to have my DNA all over the concept of restoring trust in our public institutions. Mm -hmm. There's a vacancy in trust at the federal level, certainly at the provincial level, at municipal levels, and particularly within the criminal justice system. So in my, my small way, effectively doing my job with the incredible teammates that I have, um, I feel blessed in being able to convince Canadians that there is hope that a Pierre Polyev government will certainly do things better we will give new meaning to the whole concept of transparency, accountability, and trust. 
Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that. Um, our next question is for Mr. Jenis. Um, the recent controversy surrounding the Arrive Can app has deeply concerned Canadians nationwide, sparking a national demand for true accountability. Given the current composition of our government, what concrete steps can the Conservative Party realistically undertake to ensure that this investigation continues and that people found of wrongdoing are held accountable? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let's kind of work our way back time-wise because the ultimate end point of accountability is an election. Right? That's, that's the time when people get to decide, are you satisfied with the trajectory uh, of the government under current leadership or are you looking for change? Uh, so that is the the, the, the ultimate final uh, point in terms of where Canadians can, can be heard on this. Uh, but right now, of course, we are working to hold the government accountable uh, in the context of this parliament and for as long as this parliament lasts. We have a minority parliament, which provides us with, with more tools. Uh, I've been a parliamentarian in a majority parliament, and sometimes you get the things you, you want if you uh, really create sort of public pressure and momentum around an issue, uh, or sometimes if you see areas where there's division in the government caucus, but it's, but it's hard, right? Whereas uh, the, the basic math on the committee is if, uh, if all of the opposition parties stand together on something, then we're able to pass a motion uh, uh, Pass studies, uh, order witnesses, take other other forms of, of order documents, other forms of action, and the. Um, uh, but if the government is able to pick off just one uh, member of the opposition, uh, then they're able to block what we're what we're trying to do. Um, so at a, at, a, at a broad level, in terms of the House of Commons, of course, uh, as your as your viewers will know, uh, we're living under this NDP Liberal coalition. So uh, the NDP and, and Liberals are working together on matters of confidence and supply. And frankly, we have seen them work together on a lot of other areas unrelated to confidence and supply. For a long time, we have seen the NDP assist the Liberals in covering up uh, their their scandals. Uh, uh, it's a, apparently it's a confidence supply and scandal agreement. Uh, at least, at least some of the time. But, uh, but on the government operations committee, I think um, it is, it, there, there's been such a groundswell of public awareness around this this uh, arrive scam issue. Uh, we've we've channeled that in committee, and members of parliament are hearing from their from their constituents. So I think we've been able to get a lot of things done in terms of recommending investigations, calling witnesses, um, uh, reporting uh, on what what uh, what has happened, uh, and uh, we've we've been able to create uh, that that pressure. But it hasn't just been us, right? It's been it's been the people you're communicating with, people that are listening to this, uh, that are contacting their their members of parliament, and uh, um, the you know the. The, the, the emerging technology around communications has really been on display in this in this issue as well, in terms of creating that that pressure. Um, you know, there's been there's been some mainstream media coverage, but uh, so much of what people are, are seeing on this is because people are uh, watching uh, YouTube channels, they're going on and, and tuning into the committees directly. They're seeing that the information we post, they're getting direct information about what's what's happening here, and that's really um, that's really moving the needle and creating the pressure to keep these various investigations going. Well, and to even expand on that, what we're seeing is that now that people know about Parlview View and that the media is available, um, they are actually watching the committee's real time. Um, so they're watching that for say three, three to four hours, depending on how long that takes. And then what they will do is they will come onto our, our nightly live streams at nine o'clock and then watch it all over again with our commentary to break it down because, you know, there's a lot of things that go on, um, government speak as it were, and they don't necessarily get a lot of that. So we translate a lot of that for them. So they really understand what's going on and we provide our take on, on the opinions and motivations, um, of, uh, of all the players involved. So, um, and I was just telling Mr. Brock, um, before this started. So last Wednesday after the, uh, the Christian Firth hearing, um, thousands of Canadians tuned into that. And then at nine o'clock, our live stream actually went on for five and a half hours. So, and we had thousands upon thousands of Canadians tuning in the entire time. So we ended our live stream at about 2.30 in the morning and there were still about 2,200 people still on that stream. So people are spending almost a full-time job um, tuning into this stuff now because they want to understand what's going on. 
what I would like to get to is um, for you, uh, Mrs. Block, um, Canadians have obviously struggled economically over the past eight years. And, you know, to nobody's surprise, the budgets have not balanced themselves. Um, on our channel, uh, we have addressed Mr. Polyev's and your party's stance and concern numerous times for Canadian taxpayers by eliminating government wasteful spending demonstrated uh, by this government. So leveraging your valuable experience, how would you repair the government's process of spending taxpayer dollars and hold public servants accountable? So example, you know, disciplinary actions for public servants. Um, we're, we may be seeing that in the Arrive Scam scandal, not in the process that it should actually have played out. But um, what's your take on that? Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just you know, step back a little bit in the time that I've been a parliamentarian. This is the third time that I've served on the Government Operations and Estimates Committee, the first time we were in government, um, and really got an incredibly good understanding of the need for parliamentarians to be scrutinizing the spending of government. And we were in government at the time. And uh, we spent an enormous amount of time looking at our budgetary cycle, the estimates, and and really wanting to um, find a way to encourage parliamentarians on all other committees to spend perhaps not as much time as we did, but the time that they needed to, to ensure that um, taxpayers' money was being spent wisely in all the departments across government. Certainly, you know, my second time was during the pandemic. I was the shadow minister for public services and procurement. And I think, um, you know, what we might have seen or were concerned was happening during the pandemic around government spending was confirmed afterwards. The parliamentary budget officer himself uh, spoke to that today in committee regarding the amount that um, was spent that was not on the pandemic. But then we began to look at where the money was being spent. And a year and a half ago, when we all joined OGO and we understood the need to take a look at the um, Arrive Can scam, take a look at, you know, McKinsey and the amount of money that was being spent on external consultants, um, began to understand that there were some things that needed to change. Uh, I know we foreshadowed back then that we were going to reduce the number of the, the amount of money being spent on external contracts and, and really work to create a very effective and efficient public service once again that would do the work that they were actually intended to do. Uh, we worked through a private member's bill in regards to whistleblowing. We supported that legislation, understanding that we need to be able to identify wrongdoing uh, within government, within the public service, and um, and you know, will I believe when we become government, look to strengthening that private member still in such a way that it happens. I think um, you know we were the government that introduced the Federal Accountability Act back in 2006 after the sponsorship scandal. You know, obviously a government like the current one finds the loopholes. Uh, you know gets away with things that, that we wouldn't normally want to see parliamentarians getting away with. And so that's why I think we've um, made some commitments in regards to our empowering um, an office like the Ethics Commissioner to being able to, um, uh, to create uh, harsher penalties when parliamentarians are um, contravening the ethics laws that have been put in place. And I think overall, we just need to, to take a look at the good work that we started back in 2006 and uh, review it, close the loop, those loopholes and give it more teeth. Uh, so Mrs. Cousy, the Arrive Scam scandal is a pertinent example of the rampant corruption and seemingly intentional overcomplexity of government that has existed for a very long time. Prior to the 2015 election, Mr. Trudeau accused the Harper government of avoiding accountability. Today, Mr. Polyev and the Conservatives are repeating this accusation, and rightly so, towards the current government. So how will a new Conservative government break this cycle and restore trust in our democratic institutions so that Canada can begin to heal the divisions that have occurred throughout the nation over the last eight years? No, that's a great question. 
question. Um, so I guess I'll answer it in two parts. So the first part to me, or maybe even three, the first part would be sort of restoring our fiscal house. Um, you know, I think that the one for one rule that uh, Pierre will put in place where for every new dollar of spending, you have to find a new dollar of savings, um, balancing the budget, getting our economic house in order. I think that will restore a lot of confidence in government to Canadians. The second one is incredibly obvious and something that um, everyone in this on this team here today uh, excels at, and that is that holding this government to account from an ethical perspective. I just, I cannot fathom the ethical, the 10% of the ethical lapses, any of the ethical lapses that we see in this current government with uh, a conservative government, because it, frankly, it wouldn't be tolerated. It wouldn't be tolerated by our leader, and I don't think that it would be tolerated uh, by, our, by our colleagues, and I think uh, Larry sort of led into that a, a little bit as well. So there's definitely going to be higher standards from both a, a fiscal perspective, recognizing this isn't our money, this is the money of the taxpayers, money that my mom and dad earned in our family store. This is their money that I am been given the honor to choose how to spend on their behalf. And there's just having a higher ethical uh, ethical standards, and which is, is like a no-brainer to me. It's, it's unbelievable what this government and the prime minister gets away with. And actually, it makes sense if you think about that this is the bar that they're aiming for, the prime minister, then yeah, of course they're going to believe that they can get away with anything if they see their leader getting away with anything. But I'll also just sort of zone in on the democratic institution. So I was very lucky to be the shadow minister for democratic institutions 18 months in to being elected. It was the first uh, shadow ministry I received. I was thrilled. I screamed in my stairwell when I found out that I had been placed there. And my parents took my husband and I to with Chris. So like, that was a big freaking deal. deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. But you know, if I could look at that time there and talk about real change in elections and things that I'd like to see, um, number one, get rid of the debates commission. That is just a freaking joke. And I mean, one of the Kielbergers, of course, in fact, from the Wee Charity scandal was actually a member of that debates commission. I'm not sure if he still is. Uh, number two would be defunding the media. We hear we talk about this all the time because uh, unlike being an independent uh, um, place of freedom, that Northern perspective is these are individuals who are spoon fed uh, this garbage from the current coalition and the current uh, government. I was actually on my way out today. I was talking to Frank Caputo, who got framed by a Canadian press uh, journalist just this past week, and he's livid. But this is what they get paid to do: is they get paid to promote the current regime, promote the current government, and then finally, and most importantly, foreign interference. Foreign interference has got to come to an end. I was screaming from the top of my lungs, and I hold one person responsible: Karina Gold. Yes, I will say a name. Um, for not doing anything, and uh, look at the consequences of that. I think seats were won and lost based upon uh, foreign interference outcomes. The, the, I'm not sure I would go so far as the election, but definitely, definitely seats and harassment uh, of colleagues, even just in, incredible uh, influence, foreign interference that shouldn't be there. And so that's a critical part of democratic institutions as well. And because you use that word, I'm going to use that word back to you, but it really comes back to getting our fiscal house in order, remembering our money is the taxpayer's money, and most importantly, just a higher standard of conduct. And that's what you'll see in a poly of government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. You mentioned about, um, you know, defunding the media because it's, it is, it is obvious to anybody who's looking that there is definitely partisanship uh, within the media, which is the opposite of what should be there if they are performing their true purpose, which is, you know, holding a, a government accountable in, in a democracy. They, they need to have no partisanship. As a result of that and uh, this government's comments over the last eight years, you have... You have families that have split right down the middle because uh, of the division that has been sowed. You have friendships that have been lost. You used to be able to talk about politics in Canada with anybody and, you know, you could disagree and then you move on. But that that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. You know, whether you've you know chosen to get vaccinated or not, that can divide friendships and family. And um, so there's all of this division. How do we heal that? That's a great question. Let's let Larry start. <clears throat> it's not going to happen overnight. Um, we have to lead by example. And I think um, 
I, I'm convinced that, that Pierre has a plan, has a three-month plan, post-election, six-month plan, first-year plan, that uh, Canadians are going to see some real change. It's not going to happen overnight, and uh, we just need a sufficient level of runway in order to convince Canadians and to show Canadians that um, we're doing politics differently. And his message has always been from his leadership campaign, and I was very honoured to be the Alberta South campaign chair for his leadership uh, campaign, is freedom. So, you know, as, as long as you follow the laws of the land, you can be whoever you want to be. You can make money however you want to make money. You can love whoever you want to love. You can be whoever whoever you are. His message is really about freedom. And, and when, you, when you put in the, the part about freedom, you get rid of the identity politics. You get rid of, of the right and, and the, the, right, the, right, the right position to have and the wrong position to have. Because when you have freedom, you give Canadians choice and you also give them personal responsibility. And that's something that we are dire in, in dire need of in this House of Commons right now is responsibility. Yeah, the, the last thing I would add would be that it, you need to have a leader that understands their role in uniting their country. Um, not one who is committed to, um, you know, the politics of division, pitting region against region, and, and, and someone that who's willing to put Canadians first. So Mr. Brock, this is a question that is repeatedly asked by our viewers. As you know, the snc Lavalin affair has raised concerns for some time among Canadians regarding potential interference by the Prime Minister's office within the justice system uh, by blocking RCMP investigations. Recent proceedings have mentioned the possibility of a renewed investigation into that. So in such a scenario, how would your government ensure that law enforcement can operate without interference so that even the Prime Minister and their cabinet are not above the law? I, I can understand why Canadians have repeatedly asked this question uh, of, of both uh, you and Fox. It is a question that I have often asked myself long before I got into politics as a Crown Attorney. I followed uh, a little bit of, of the SNC hearings. I just on the, you know, from an outside observer's perspective, just hearing the evidence, reading the commentary, it was, um, it was plainly obvious to me that the elements of obstruction of justice were met without me doing a deep dive into the evidence. Now, as you know, uh, through my new role uh, on the Ethics uh, Commission, sorry, Ethics Committee, um, I've been able to do a much deeper dive. I've reviewed transcripts. I've had an opportunity of, of questioning not only the uh, commissioner of the RCMP, but also the deputy commissioner, both of which said the right appropriate things, that no one is above the law, that everyone is treated equally, that if there were reasonable and probable grounds, which is the legal test for a law enforcement officer to make in terms of laying a charge, that it didn't matter what the person's last name was, it didn't matter what position they hold, they would do their job. So I took that at face value, but as I dug deeper, it became obvious that um, the so-called four-year investigation after all the events were revealed to, to the public, which resulted in the uh, firing, I don't call it a demotion, I don't call it a shuffle, I call it a firing um, of Jody Wilson-Raybould, her brave decision to uh, to block the Prime Minister's attempts, the Clerk of the Privy Council's attempts, uh, members of the PMO's attempts, the Department of Finance attempts to influence her decision, it became clear that there was fertile ground for any law enforcement officer to properly investigate. Now, we know the Ethics Commissioner, Mr. Dion, uh, created a... a a damning report, I think it's called Trudeau number two, uh, found that he definitely uh, violated uh, numerous ethic laws in relation uh, to his conduct. Um, but the important distinction though, is that an ethics commissioner is not a law enforcement officer. And although he has a mandate to report criminality to the police, 
He chose not to. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't criminality. It just, I think he forecasted a situation that the RCMP would already be investigating this matter, and he didn't want necessarily to interfere in the independence of that investigation. But what was revealed is when you take a look at the steps that the ethics commissioner took in terms of receiving the evidence, reviewing the evidence, and interviewing dozens of witnesses, and you contrast that to the RCMP, over four years they interviewed four people. They never interviewed the prime minister, never even asked to interview the prime minister, mm -hmm. never interviewed Michael Warnock, never interviewed anyone in the PMO's office or the PCO's office or the Minister of Finance. All these witnesses would have been available to the RCMP to investigate. Now, I put it to the RCMP commissioner, you can understand why Canadians are frustrated that you ultimately came to the conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to continue the investigation and ultimately lay a charge. I said, it would appear that there is a two-tier level of justice in this country, and that you were politically motivated and influenced not to charge a sitting prime minister. No sitting prime minister has ever been charged criminally. That should not legally be the benchmark. That should not be the precedent. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your title is. If you break our law that applies to everybody, consequences should flow. Now, the RCMP didn't do their job, in my view. There were a number of legal remedies for them to obtain legal documents, and I'm happy to share that on a future show with you if you'd like. But I'm going to be asking um, our leadership to invite the OPP commissioner to essentially start from scratch and do a proper and thorough investigation to determine whether or not there are legal grounds. From a Crown Attorney's perspective, I believe there is. I can't lay a charge. It has to come from the police agency. So how will our government be doing things differently? How would a Pierre Polya government be doing things differently? I think at a minimum, where you have a prime minister or a minister involved in criminality that is being investigated, there should be a blanket waiver of cabinet confidences. You cannot hide as a minister or a prime minister behind the concept of solicitor and client privilege and cabinet confidences to hide your criminality. Does that mean the prime minister can just go around in the house and outside the house and do as he pleases with no consequences and claim somehow there was a discussion about what he, would, what he was doing or what he was planning on doing that that would prevent him from investigation? That is the wrong message. So I would hope that we will do things differently, that when you're under, when you're under police investigation at the ministerial level, and as prime minister, that there'd be a waiver. And there'd also be a pathway as well for any law enforcement agency to make immediate reference and application to the Supreme Court of Canada to provide guidance on how to obtain additional pieces of evidence that are not freely delivered by those officials. You haven't thought about this at all, Larry. I'm not thought about this. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, and um, we'll uh, we'll we'll cut it there. It's, it's been fantastic uh, talking with all of you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, our viewers would wish that this would go on for another two hours, I'm sure, but um, thank you so much for this. And it's an open invitation for any of you, all of you, uh, if you would like to uh, come back on uh, Northern Perspective. So that's uh, that's phenomenal. Thank you very much, everybody. We sincerely appreciate it. Thank you.